Hi, welcome, messy people. This is a great episode of Everything's Messy podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. I have with me today Mike Strasbaugh. He is a guitar ninja, as he describes it. He is a TED Talk enthusiast, and um, he has a messy medical journey to boot. And I'm so excited to have him here. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, this is just, I'm uh, like I said, I'm, I'm fanning a little bit and just so excited that you're here. I absolutely enjoyed your uh, TEDx talk. And so let's, um, I don't want to say jump right into the mess, but why don't you start with a little bit about you and what you're up to and what's going on? Okay. First, um, aren't you so lucky to be talking to me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm fanning over here. Yeah, so no, amazing. it's, it's no, great. Um, I'm kidding. Um, so today, as we speak right now, you know, I'm a 52 year old guy living in the mountains of Colorado. Um, I, I teach music. That's all I do. It's I'm living the dream, especially after a, a more than a decade of what could be considered medical hell, a medical yes. nightmare, doing my thing. Um, Post grad school, I have all my master's degrees. I have three master's degrees in music, and today I teach. You know, kind of an exclusive boutique uh, client or a roster of students. Uh, before COVID, I did I got a chance to teach college, but then you know, COVID took care of that. Um, so I really am living the dream at this point. Um, that's my main gig. When I'm not teaching, I'm hanging out with my fiance, my cats, or I'm playing my guitar for myself. So life is pretty cool. That's awesome. Yep. I and love then, that. And I shameless plug here. There's my school. It's official because I have a shirt. Um, yes. Have, yeah, so Strasbaugh Guitar and Music Academy is what I'm going into. I've been teaching one on one for almost 30 years. That's just my thing. But you know, makes sense to just do it online so i've got my exclusive private school Strasbaugh guitar and music academy the website's on construction under construction but if people want to contact me even just to say hi they can do it via social right now that's awesome and congratulations on the school Thank so you. let's um you know we were mentioning obviously this is everything's messy so i wouldn't have you on here obviously if there wasn't a messy story behind oh, yeah. it <laughs> yep. so um and you've talked about you know the music Let's uh, get into a little bit about um, the medical side of kind of what started, what happened, what transpired, and then um, how did music fit into that? So that's kind of sure. the double-edged uh, question here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, but, but well, if you have a double-edged sword, it's part of the same sword in such that, or that in my life and music and the guitar and life and death and my my disease it's all part of the same thing you know it's obviously if it's a genetic disease which mine is it is literally part of everything so <clears throat> excuse me um going back not to birth well i guess to birth and I've, I've explained it this way before and i'll explain it again my disease which is called common variable immunodeficiency it's one in fifty thousand. Wow. um and yeah so it's pretty it's not common the name is is a bit of a misnomer but you know, so it's one in 50,000. Um, and if you get on like WebMD or, you know, get, get a, a medical definition, it sounds very clinical. Um, basically, it means, or to put it in layman's terms, when, when you're born and you have my disease, um, I'm just like normal people in terms of my immune system. I'm, you know, I'm fresh out of the oven, so to speak. But right away, slowly, imperceptibly over decades, your immune system or my immune system, it just gets less and less effective at fighting. So it's like having early onset dementia the second mm -hmm. you're born. Wow. Your, your immune system does. Because your immune That's system it. has it has a memory in what's called T cells and B cells. That's your immune system's memory. You're going to say something? No, I was just saying that's an interesting way to describe it. I like the way that you describe that. Thanks. Having um, I try, well, Describing it like with medical terms, that doesn't help anybody. Yeah. But yeah, we can all relate <laughs> to it. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it is like early onset dementia. And so um, over, <clears throat> over the years, you know, it gets slowly, slowly worse. So you don't notice it right away. So it's a very, it's a very insidious disease because it gets bad really, really slow over decades. So it's almost like the ultimate gaslight. Meaning you were sick a lot as a child or meaning you, yep. it took you longer to get over colds. And so that just wasn't really something that people would be like, oh, you know, this needs to be checked out. Kind of all of that. But when uh -huh. you're a kid, like everybody's got ear infections and sinus infections when you're a kid, right? It's just the thing you go through by being a kid. So of course you didn't think anything of it. You know, I had my adenoids taken out and I always had sinus infections and ear infections. 
Um, but in my teenage years, they didn't really go away. In fact, like such, I had such bad sinus infections. Um, I was on so much Motrin at one point. I was like 15 or 16. Uh, it ate, I got an ulcer because it ate a hole in my stomach. I was on so I much. I can't even imagine. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, of course, it was military doctors and they just kind of throw medicine at it. Um, but either, either way, like it, they never went away. Sure. I was always getting respiratory infections, which is kind of one of the, one of the things they look for these days is respiratory infections because your respiratory system is where everything comes in. It's your gatekeeper. Sure. So it, anything respiratory, if pink eye, even sinus pneumonia or sinuses, pneumonia, ear infections, sinus infections, all the infections, you just get those. Um, so as a kid, they weren't necessarily worse as a kid. I don't think, I don't know because I only have my own experience, but I got a lot more of them. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. And then as I got into my early twenties, you know, still getting more ear infections and it was right near the end of undergrad. Um, okay. Wait, before you say undergrad, I'm just going to turn left here a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me, you know, as you're going through it as a teenager, did you ever think something's not right? Did you ever think like, was it, was it, were you on that deep of a level or was it just like, man, I'm sick of being sick. Sick of being sick. Sick of being sick. Yeah. Plus, and again, this is a big part of it. I think being a military kid and being me being a military kid, what they told you, you did. The doctor said this. All right. I believe the doctor follow mm. your orders. The doctor says there's nothing to worry about. Are you getting enough sunlight? Are you taking vitamins? Yes, sir. And that was it. The that was, it. That was the extent right. of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was a little kid. And, this, and again, this is, you know, 80s, way before the internet. So what they said, you're like, I guess that's probably true. And I didn't think much of it. Um, plus, what did your parents think? Were your parents like, you know, were, were they just accepting of it? Did they kind of think, hey, something <clears throat> is not right? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. And they certainly didn't tell me about it. Like if they were worried about their kid, they wouldn't come to their kid and say, man, there's sure. something wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> but that right. being said, it wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't at that point, you know, my teens early or childhood and, and teens, it wasn't so egregious. Like I wasn't getting so many more infections that it was like a red light. It was just more than normal people. If yeah. a normal person got like an ear infection once every couple of years, I might get one a year, two a year. Then gotcha. And I'm assuming you just, you weren't a complainer. You didn't complain about it. There was no, nothing. It was just something you just took it and kept on going. And that was sucked and you deal with it and you take the antibiotics all the way and you do what the doctor says. You get plenty of water and you do it. Yep. Yeah. Just okay. You do your job. Yeah, man. So <laughs> you get to undergrad. Yep. And so it's 1996. Um, and I'm earning my bachelor's degree in classical guitar. Um, well, well, we'll we'll talk about the music part later because I okay. started playing music as a teenager, and since you watched my TED talk, you know it wasn't just oh, guitar is cool. Like it was a make or break, life saving thing for me. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yep. So music wasn't just something I dug. It was it was my soul. Yeah. It, it, there was no. I mean, once I started that guitar right there, that's my first guitar. Wow. I never put it. I never put it down. Never ever wow. put it down. What do so, you think it was that captivated you? just the freedom to express or just uh, something all your own? Were there any other musicians in your family? No, be, the people in my family could not find a note with two hands. <laughs> my sister tried to play the clarinet and that was just abuse. <laughs> Nobody should have to go through that. Sorry, Shannon. Um, but no, n not, not at all. Um, all the stuff that you said it was, it was that. It was a chance to express. Um, I didn't, so much is hindsight, right? I didn't mm -hmm. know it at the time, but... <clears throat> the guitar, the, the the style of music that I was playing, it was 80s. It was heavy. It was thrash metal. It was like really heavy metal in the 80s. Metallica, Megadeth. Love um, it. Love it. Love it, right? Yeah. California bands, San Francisco <laughs> bands. Um, that was, it's still my heart. Like if I'm in the car, I'm probably listening to first generation 80s thrash. Um, but I had been in a musical family. They listened to music, but this was the 70s and the 80s. And my parents were soft pop soft rock midwest the children of midwest farmers like they weren't cool california people listening to fog hat um no it was, it was ann murray and it was the bellamy brothers and some beach boys not the cool beach boys but mom liked the beatles that was cool otherwise it's pretty bad it's kind of 
and there was some good music but in other words it didn't inspire me to think musically at all yeah um and then my childhood well i'll just do it now my childhood it's a military family we moved to colorado springs and the family falls apart um, from where though from where did you come from um well we were military so we moved every three years that's a big part of it but we had just come from germany actually oh wow okay yep. and that was in uh, july of 84 so i was a you know, 12 13 year old kid when we moved here and the family situation wasn't great at that point mm. life is life right um <clears throat> dad went his way my sisters were old enough to be out of the house and then mom she just kind of lost her way for a couple of years and so she would be gone for weeks at a time so were you baby were you baby brother I'm the baby boy yep gotcha and so i'm the baby and i would not see another person well i wouldn't see any of my family members for weeks at a time so i would come home from school and the house was empty and mm. for weeks and i know my mom had been there because there would be food, but like she would never be there. Um, and again, it, we talked about it, you know, and bygones be bygones, but I mean, sure. it damages a kid. It damages a kid and it affects you, obviously. So I didn't have anybody and I, I had no voice of my own. I couldn't mm. tell people this isn't right. I couldn't tell them this is wrong. I couldn't, that, that I need love and support and who is taking care of me? Does anybody love me, right? Yeah. Wow. So am I important? Nobody's here. Um, so you got a 15 year old kid dealing with that on top well, of being had, 15 in, in general. 15, <laughs> yep. And yeah, exactly. So there was luckily I had my best friend at the time. His family was kind of like a, 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 a secondary family for me. They really helped me out a lot, but my family wasn't there at the time. So um, I needed something. And as it turns out, I love this story because it's so true. And I, there's so much that I can remember it. Um, it was a 10th grade English class. English class and it was a musical show and tell day and this kid Brian put a white cassette tape into a boom box and he presses play and it's disposable heroes by Metallica. Da, 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 wow. And, I and it that. just grabbed you. It didn't just grab me. It I didn't what it it became my voice. It became a funnel. Um and I didn't when I heard it I I, again, hindsight, now I can put it into words. At the time, it just electrified me and energized me in a way that nothing ever had. And wow. I, didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what to call that, but I just, I, it, was a, it was this energy as like, I don't ever want this to stop. I don't know what this is, what it means, but this is what it feels like. And now I look at it and I realize that's the way I felt. Yeah. Like that energy, it's not hate. It's anger. It's justifiable anger at having been wronged. And this, it was my defiance. It was my, it was my sword. It was my shield. It was my right. voice. Right. And so I wanted to do that. Listening was great, but that wasn't enough for me. I obsessed about getting my first guitar, finally did. And after that, it was me and a guitar and learning every Metallica song I could for a while. And wow. That, so do, were you self-taught? No lessons? You for, just... many, for many years, for wow. several years, for wow. several years. Yep. And so, you know, there's no internet, it's all me. And I won't get on a soapbox about it, but with all the how-to videos for everything, it, it strips some of our humanity away, which actually is a big part of, it's important to me because of what I've gone through. Sure. To have something that you have to earn and build and focus on and create discipline for, that's our humanity. That's our creative spark. We have to have that. It's the only reason we went from stone tools to the moon in 10,000 years. That's sure. the only reason. So I'm proud of that. Like it was me and that guitar, no instruction manual. If you want to do it, sit down and you just do it. All you figure day it out. You love it and you figure it out. Either you do it or you don't. So many people quit. I never did because I loved it. Go ahead. I, well, I, I was just going to add, I'd like to think too, um, and maybe I'm off, but I'd like to think too, as a Gen Xer, I'm a fellow Gen Xer. We were kind of, I know, you know, our generation was the latchkey kids. And, you know, you mentioned being alone a lot, you know, you come home from school, we were alone, we had to fend for ourselves. And there was no internet, there was no just looking up on Google on how to figure it out, you had to figure it out, or it didn't get yeah. done, period. It didn't get done. And, yep. and that's not to take anything away. We, we are all products of our generation. We, if we were, if we had cell phones, Sarah, we'd have looked at them. Yes. Not like we were like, well, I'm Gen X. So right. I, I didn't call it Gen X until later. There, it wasn't there. And I'm so glad. I'm yeah. so glad I became a human being, a fully developed adult yeah. before the internet was a thing, let alone social media. I'm well, so Well, not glad. only that, I'm glad, at least for my sake, there's no proof of anything I did. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, I boy, I wish I, I wish I could be as cool as that. No, I was the <laughs> most rule following, introverted, quiet, milk toast kid. I was literally the kid from Stranger Things. Me and my friends rode bikes to the arcade and played D and D on the weekends. That's what we That's did, cool. and that was That's it. Cool. It was cool. It was a lot of fun. It was. I loved. Yeah. I loved the eighties, man. I yeah. did. Yeah. But back yeah. to this. But back, so so it's in the eighties, and I'm doing my guitar thing, um, and then, you know, again, it's my life. It's all I can think about, and I can't imagine not doing music for my life. Do you not think the star. music kept you out of trouble? I don't. You know, no, I don't because no. I didn't want to get into trouble. That wasn't That's my good. thing. That's good. I liked, I loved school. I liked going home and doing home. I love it. I love math. I love science. I was just somebody who liked learning. I just wow. like learning stuff. That's cool. To me, like I, I loved undergrad. I loved when I went back to grad school, the hallowed halls of academia. I'm a geek for it. I love that stuff. <laughs> really. So I like it, that. It wasn't about trouble. Um, me and my friends are playing D and D. You don't get into trouble when you're in a basement playing D and D. <laughs> But it did, I think it kept me sane and it gave me, it, it gave me a purpose. It absolutely mm -hmm. did. And, and words like purpose and passion, I, they're, they're obviously strong buzzwords. And when they're used appropriately, I think they have great power. Definitely. Um, absolutely. Um, so it, trouble, no, it gave me an identity. It, it did. Now, because people, it wasn't that long before Mike, the guy with the guitar, the guy who plays guitar. That's what people knew me as. And I love that. Because otherwise, before that, I was a blank slate, and I didn't want to be. Sure. I was striving to find who I was, and it's kind of hard when there's you know there's no family. You're just trying to survive, right? Yeah. So you're not too worried about that. You're just trying to make it. Um, and so when I discovered music, that's where I really felt just for me, not to get fame or nothing. I just wanted to do this. Whatever that meant, that's what I want to do. It so brought joy. It, it brought, brought joy. It brought joy. It brought meaning. It brought purpose. It it sparked my humanity in the way nothing else did and that was my thing i knew i'd found my calling so you know i went to berkeley college of music for a year i got accepted there i was just i was a talented kid when you play every day all day you're gonna get good at something and so i did that then i finished my undergrad here in pueblo um just a small school in on has it always been guitar that was been yes. your choice yep yes absolutely. Okay. that was my main instrument now you mentioned lessons I didn't take lessons for the first little while, for the first couple of years, but it didn't take long. And this is actually a, a problem I see today just because of the internet, quite honestly, social media. Um, I knew how to do this with my fingers, but I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what any of the notes or chords or nothing. I was just like, I, I, I looked at the book and it tells me where to put my fingers. So I had an existential crisis. I want to do this, but I have no idea what's the point if I don't even know what I'm doing. So I started to take lessons, not to get better at this part of it, but this part of it. To actually study the musical part of it. Yep. Classical guitar. Classical guitar is what got me hooked on it. I went to jazz. And then after that, I realized music is big brain stuff and I wanted to be a part of it. So that's, that's right when I started college, kind of. So, you know, first year of college, I'm taking as many music classes as I could. So I, want, I wanted to go to college and get a degree in music. And so that's what happened in May of 1996. But during the last two months of undergrad, it's kind of funny how they just kind of dovetail one into the next. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm wrapping up my undergrad studies in, in uh, April and May of 96. Um, I'm on, not surprisingly, I've got sinus infections, probably ear infections, I don't know. I've had hundreds of respiratory infections at, in my life. Um, but I'm on, you know, some pretty heavy duty antibiotics. It's kind of working. It's taking longer and longer to heal at this point or to get better because I'm in my early 20s. And right about then is where my disease, again, common variable immunodeficiency, it's where it really has reached a point where it starts rearing its ugly head in big ways. It's sort of hard. working against you. Oh, in a big way because, in fact, I do start my TED Talk this way. May 4th, I get my degree. But for the prior, previous you know, six weeks, eight months, I would started feeling a little weaker, a little just weaker, less energy, a little out of breath. Um, and then like last week, two weeks of school, started turning yellow, getting jaundiced. Like, well, this can't be good. No. Probably isn't great. It's not a good color for me. Um, but I thought, well, I'll just finish, you know, I'll get my degree and then, you know, we'll see what happens after that. Like, I'll, I'll worry about it afterwards. <clears throat> um, so I graduate on the 4th and one week to the day later, like it's, it's, obviously getting worse quicker 
and I go to the emergency room one week after college, and that was the first of seven times in my life. And my in my TED talk, I said it was six because I forgot about one of them. <laughs> it's it's the first time when it's so many. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, you yeah when when and actually it's just this first one where a doctor looks you in the face and says you might want to call your parents and say goodbye. <gasps> that was the first time. It was the first, it was, I was a 24 year old kid, one week out of college. Oh. That was hemolytic anemia. It's where your spleen, your spleen does spleen stuff. Uh, it does all kinds of stuff. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but I know it kills off the old red blood cells. You know, they're done. They're depleted. Get rid of them. Well, my spleen got roid rage and it just was killing all the red blood cells, including the ones that were carrying oxygen. So I was slowly suffocating. I was, oh my gosh. yeah, that's what was happening over these weeks. Um, it was bad. Um, so I was in the ER for 12 hours that day and they're taking bl blood tests and questions, ask just all the things. See, and all I remember this in the Ted talk, I guess I didn't realize that it was the first time that you'd gone into the hospital, that that's when they told you that. Yep. Wow. And but again, this was a long journey. They told, they told you that this, but that time, but that wasn't the end of it. No, that was the, that, that's actually, I, it's funny. I tell people it's like a 12 year medical nightmare. It started before that, but this sure. was the first day that I actually, May 4th, well, May 11th is the day that I start, January 8th, 2007 at 11.23 a.m., but who's counting? That's when I kind of stop it because that's the day I got diagnosed. That's the time uh -huh. that my doctor called me and I was working in an office in Columbia, Missouri, where I was living, and I heard the words common variable immunodeficiency for the first time. I was 36. And you went, so, huh? It, I, I don't, I, I, there are things I remember about that day, but it's the most surreal day Yeah. when the doctor said, you're not crazy. It's not just you. Cause it, for, you got to realize when I talk about common variable immunodeficiency, this is the craziest part. I didn't know I had something the sure. whole time after it was done is when a doctor said, no, you've got common variable immunodeficiency. It's a rare disease. Here's what it does. Here's why all of the things that have ever happened to you have happened. You're not crazy. There's nothing wrong with you because there was nobody like me as far as I knew. I've right. never, again, this is pre-internet. I had never met anybody that had anything similar. Doctors would say, again, are you taking vitamins? Are you exercising? Here's more antibiotics. Please huh. don't come back. Like, cause they didn't know what it was and they didn't want to deal with me. So I say like, often on this show, that's it, it's called practicing medicine for a reason because they don't know they're practicing. <laughs> Now, and now, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, should I have gone to an immunologist? Well, boy, if I had hindsight with everything, I'd be a bajillionaire, right? Sure. So I look at it now and I thought, boy, I wish I would have blank, but that's when I got diagnosed. So 1996 to 2007, um, I was 24, you know, close to 25 and then 36 when I got diagnosed. So that very first one of my TED talk, that was the first time. And that was, <clears throat> there would be others that were worse than that one but that was it i got there at about noon on may 11th and about 12 hours later is when the doctor said and you know er doctors are very calm they're trained to be calm so you don't freak out mr Strasbaugh, blah blah medical jargon hemolytic anemia wiping out all your red blood cells we're gonna do our best champ don't make plans oh man For, like ever <sighs> you're done you might want to call your parents. Actually, what I asked him was, should I call my parents and say goodbye? He's like, you, Mr. Strasbaugh, you may want to do that. My oh. parents were separated. <clears throat> they were, you know, or they were divorced, you know, by that point. So I made two phone calls to my mom and to my dad. I'm getting emotional. Yeah. That was, that was hard, man. Oh, my yeah. gosh. And, and so up until this point, you haven't lived your life any differently other than taking on these colds and taking on these things. <laughs> And, and so after that, um, and you're released from the hospital at some point, mm -hmm. do you start living your life differently? <clears throat> no, <clears throat> we thought it was an anomaly. Like, wow, we don't know what that was. Hope it doesn't happen again. Here's prednisone for six months and just keep an eye on stuff. Wow. Right? Steroids for six months. Wow. Oh, was, dude. Wow. I was hungry. All my joints were stiff. I had moon face, the moonest face. Oh yeah. I was on 120 milligrams a day and it took six months to taper down. Wow. Yeah. Cause they, they thought it was leukemia, AIDS, lupus. They checked for everything. Um, yeah. But so 
And so at this time, and you said 96 at this time, is there treatment yet? Is there no, any? No, 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 I had nothing until I got diagnosed. My first, my first treatment, actually, I just got my, my treatment. It's every four weeks. Um, it's called IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin. I, I get it every four weeks. It comes in a box. Um, where's my IV stick? Oh, I can't see it now. It was last week, but I get it every four weeks. No, that wouldn't happen until I got diagnosed. Before that, you're on your own. So as your immune system's going down and down and down, the doctors didn't know that. No, you're just dealing with it for 11 years. Wow. And it gets worse every month, every month until, and it starts to spiral faster and faster. So 2004, 2005, and 2006, Dude, that all the horrible shit happened in those three years. It, God, dude, <clears throat> 1996, that was that moment, the hemolytic anemia. That was like lucky to get out, obviously. I wasn't supposed to live through that one. Regular people have a hard time living through that one. I didn't know my immune system had taken a day off. So that's with, that's with an immune system. That's a tough one to live through. I was this close to a blood transfusion, like a complete blood transfusion. They were ready to pull the trigger, but they finally, they got my... They got me to stabilize, you know, got me off the antibiotics that I was on. They didn't know what it was, but they're just shotgunning me with like all the antibiotics, all the intravenous IV antibiotics. Which helped the hemocrat come up, I'm sure, which helped some of it get yep. out to those dangerous yep. levels. Yeah. yeah to just exactly. To basically put a Band-Aid on it and just hopefully keep me alive. So at that point, you know, 24, it wasn't like when I was 36, when I was just completely done. I still had some, I, some T cells and B cells. So- I was better than I would be certainly, but after what, you know, probably a week and a half, two weeks in the hospital with hemolytic anemia, they released me. So I'm on prednisone for six months, but so nothing major like that. I call them my widow maker events because that's kind of what they are, but nothing like that for years. But what would happen right away was more respiratory, still respiratory infections. Like a year after that, I would get pneumonia for the first time for no reason in the middle of summer. Wow. Um, but what did start to happen, and this is where this is where it started to get really cruel. Tendonitis, because it wasn't just rest, it wasn't just external factors; it's internal. When you do this, and you're doing the stuff that I'm doing, like really technical stuff, it, it it's micro tears in your muscles and your tendons, and they don't heal. So they get inflamed. And so I would get tendonitis. It was not regular people tendonitis. It was chronic. It was crippling. And if I triggered it, if I did this too long on a day, it would trigger it. And I'd be stuck for, stuck like a statue for six months. And it hurt. Wow. Red. It looked like sausages, man. And then I would have to get prednisone or steroid shots just to get it to go down. So basically. And that kept you from your joy. It, it, that kept you from me being able to play. Right. So yeah, how so, do you, how do you take that mentally? How do you accept that? Because I'm not sure. I, I know. I don't know that I'd be able to just be like, Oh, okay. Let, you know, we'll go on. I mean, no, you, you no, And you're absolutely, you don't, you don't accept. And then I don't mean this flippantly because I chose to not have children because music was my child. What do you do when your child dies? Yeah. If they're, or, or they're taken, what do you do? You, you do, you just do. That's a big part of this. You just do. And you, you find out if you can. Mm. So that happens when this, so this is, you know, two, three years after undergrad is when this is happening. Cause as soon as I'm done with undergrad, you know, I'm in really technical progressive metal bands. I'm playing my ass off. It's ripping my hands up. So it happens pretty quick while this is getting worse and worse. I, I talk about this in my Ted talk too. Um, <clears throat> 1998, so it's October of 1998. I can see it's an overcast day. I know exactly where I was in my house. I was playing video games. I'm 27 years old, right? Three years out of undergrad, two years out of undergrad. Holy shit. Um, I'm playing video games. My left ear starts to ring. Now I was getting ear infections by then really commonly. I was like, all right, well, I'll back to the doctor on Monday because it was Friday night. I was like, ah, I'll just deal with it for the weekend. Go to the doctor on Monday, get antibiotics, this old thing. But this was different because like it was ringing, but it got louder and louder. And just like, woo, like a horn in my ear for like an hour. And then that was at four o'clock and then right about five o'clock, an hour later, it starts to go away finally. And it goes away over about a half an hour. 
But as it goes away, so did the hearing in my left ear. And I went deaf in an hour. Wow. Permanently deaf. I'm deaf in my left ear. I lost my left ear in an hour on a random Friday in 1998. I'm a musician, dude. Jeez. I lived in terror for years after that. Just what happens when the other one goes? Yeah. Learn and the hits like just keep coming. My goodness. Yeah. So the late nineties sucked. Yeah. So that, so, and so that's happening while this is happening. How could I not think that this was so incredibly personal? Mm -hmm. It was like, it, it, it wasn't long after that. And this is how I, I say it this way. Cause it's true. You just become the disease. You lose who you are. If you're always sick, like we, we watch movies, like, you know, they're two hours long and the hero survives and all this stuff happens. Those are movies, man. Sure. Yeah. That's in the movie. Yeah. It's unrealistic. Yeah. You know, yeah it's, un, it's, it's, and it's dangerously unrealistic because yeah. you're like, just be strong. You're like, shut up with your be strong, dude. Yeah. Be strong is what they call you after the fact. I, I found out I was strong afterwards, but sure. during it, you feel anything, but you feel victimized and every, like it took my hand. It took my ear. You're like, these aren't, this is stuff specific to me as a musician. Yeah. So like, this is my own body. You can't get out of this prison. Yeah. So that was the late nineties into the early two thousands, you know, just more, more respiratory stuff get a divorce from my first ex-wife <clears throat> uh she kept the old rental house and i moved in with my mom and and my sister and her family my sister and her husband and her preschool age kid and that is what made it that was the dumbest thing that i have ever done because preschool kids they are petri dishes and they bring home everything they are, they are walking <laughs> They bring home everything and then some. Yep. And so, I mean, I didn't know at the time. So that was in 2004. 2004 was rough. So it starts off, you know, I'm, I'm obviously going through marital problems, but uh, beginning of 2004, I finally had tendonitis surgery on this finger and this thumb just to be able to function, not okay. to be able to do all this again, okay. to be able to use my hand and zip up my pants or hold a cup anything um so that was like may or something then <clears throat> pleurisy do you know what pleurisy is i do tax the pleurisy. lungs yeah yeah it was it's the it's the lining of it's your of the lung off. yeah yeah i've had morphine in my life a couple times and that was the best morphine i've ever had um <laughs> it was a day it was a just one day and it's one of the, the longest three days of my life was in intensive care when wow. I had stepped. That was organ failure, um, on the brink of organ failure. But that day of pleurisy, I've never had so much pain. Well, actually, my neck was too. I've gone through a lot of stuff. You know, yeah, this, it just keeps um, getting messier and messier. It, it, and I was going to say too, of uh, you know, in reference to the preschool age kids, you know, most kids who are healthy, it doesn't they bounce back. In fact, they're still bouncing while they're sick. It takes a really high grade fever for them to just stop and not be moving. <laughs> yep. So to yep. have those germs come in and of course they're, you know, back to themselves in a day or two, and then you be exposed to all of that with what you're going. I mean, not, yep. you're not bouncing at all. That's no, no, no. no. You're getting flattened. Yeah. Yeah. So when yeah. I moved in, like it was right away, the, the pleurisy happened right away on the way to the little community hospital in Colorado Springs at the time. Um, I broke my mom's dashboard and I didn't shatter her windshield, but I put a crack in it with my fist because it hurt so much and I just had to get it out somehow. Oh, wow. And then they got there and um, that's when they gave me the first, the first morphine I ever had. It's a weird feeling if you never had it. Like, and it's true, like it still hurts, but you don't care. It was, it was like that. They finally wow. got that down, but then um, really bad sinus infections after that. And then August. August 9th, is that the date that was? I say it in my TED talk. August 9th, 2004, it was a Monday. That's when I That's when I had viral encephalitis, which is the craziest thing in the world because it's inflammation of the brain. I was just gonna say it's swelling of the brain, yeah. yeah. So my nephew, he brought home whatever. Well, this is when West Nile virus was going around. Okay. I thought it was that at first. I wake like on, like during the weekend, like I look at my fingertips and there's like little blisters on the tips of my toes and my fingers and that and they thought maybe it was anthrax hoof and mouth disease because i guess that's one of the signs of it 
<clears throat> and at that point, it's 2004. I've been really sick for eight years. I'm like, okay, what now? I'm like, all right, let's drink juice and take vitamins and hope this is just a cold or something. I woke up Monday and my body was on the tip from here all the way down to my toes. It was just fire. Like I, I couldn't tell where my fingers were, where my toes, where my stomach, Jeez. everything was just fire. I just had no, I had no concept of individual stuff. I was just a flame is what I was. And I'm like, mom, help me upstairs. Cause I was, I was just wrecked and had no explanation. Cause I didn't feel great before that, but certainly not like this. Sure. She and my sister helped me up to the kitchen table. And I do talk about this in my Ted talk and I'm slumped over the table, just barely slumped over and just like barely, you know, spine erect slumped over like six inches from the kitchen table with my face and my mom, she puts food in front of me. And I remember it was like fried eggs and fried bologna and a piece of toast. It's kind of like a you know, standard thing that she would make. She puts it in front of me and she walks out of the room and I'm just staring at it and she walks back in and it's nine hours later. Oh my goodness. And I, cause I was just peripherally aware for going out and then coming in. I had stared at a plate of food for nine hours, hadn't moved or nothing. Then, that's and then the last, that's and that, incredible. So, isn't that nuts? The, yeah. Like objectively, like if somebody was telling me the story, I would just say, damn, that's crazy. It just happened to happen to me. So I remember her walking back in. And then I remember looking up in the corner and seeing a TV in the corner of the room. The, when she walked in the room, that was Monday night. I look up at the TV. It's Saturday night. That's it was that it was in an instant. So seven or six days, whatever, are gone. That's all. I, and I've heard really cool stories of all the stuff in between. Wow. Because apparently my eyes were open and I was saying really, really crazy stuff and doing crazy things. I was not there. Wow. I was totally out. Yep, That's so scary. That's so scary. scary. Yep. Some people never come out of it. I was lucky. And I've actually been thinking about the idea of luck lately. I was lucky that I had viral encephalitis and not bacterial. I was lucky that I went to the ER that day and with hemolytic anemia and didn't wait one day. There are so many things that I'm lucky for that I think, man, I'm really lucky that that happened. That's a very interesting and unique perspective. That's for sure. That is definitely for sure. It's gotta be right. Cause if I look at it, like, why does this keep happening? I have to, I have to live with that thought. I have to live with that and spend the only life that I've ever got wondering why is this happening? And I'm, again, I'm human. Sure. I wasn't like, sweet, this is going to be <laughs> all right. Always look on the bright side of life. No, it, but I, this is the one life that I've got. So keep going as long as I can. So I looked at it now. I'm like, I'm lucky that I came out of it. I'm lucky that they didn't have to drill a hole into my skull to relieve the pressure. Cause that was the next thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and after that, you know, that was a Saturday night when my brain rebooted. And after that, I had to relearn how to be a person again. Yep. I didn't know what reality was when I came back, like shit was weird. Like everything, nothing made sense. I had to reestablish reality. You're on a bad trip and you didn't get to have any of the fun to get there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was the worst uh. trip and it, and it was real and it didn't stop for a very long time. It took many, many moons of, you know, all of all the therapies and stuff, but just every single, every moment of every day focusing on how do I use this thing? I would try to use, move my right foot and my left or my right hand and my left foot would move. Or I would try to think of words. Um, like I would try to talk about the nurses at the hospital and I would say turtles because it kind of sounds like nurses. Sure. I would talk about my calves hurt because everything hurt, but I would say my doves, like just weird stuff and this would happen this would go on for months until slowly i went back to normal my what was the cycle, total total recovery time you think if you had to slap a number on it six months wow that's yeah, a I, long time to not feel like yourself on like, top of going like, yeah on top of going out through everything else that's yeah, a long no, time to just sit there and be like who, you know who am i well that exactly because you literally don't know who you are and you don't know how you're supposed to be thinking or what that thing is, or you don't know. That's why, like, I, I mean, I look at like Alzheimer's for instance, and I think, God, if there's anything I don't want, it's that. 
because I knew something was wrong. You have that, you, you can't say to yourself, something is wrong. You don't have that wherewithal. Mm -hmm. You just, your mind knows something is wrong, but you're frustrated because you can't even say something is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's, it's frustration without even knowing it's frustration because you don't know the word for frustration. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, you can't even verbalize it. All you can do is kind of think about it, even though you're not even sure what you're really thinking about. And is it real? And is it true? And when you say, I'm thinking about it, well, are you? Because who are you? Who right. am I? Who's thinking about it? Did yeah, you it have memories? Did you, were you able to recall, you know, memories of any sort? Was it, or was that part of the recovery too? Um, you mean like memories of stuff that happened during? No, just like uh, childhood memories or remembering. Oh, yes. You yes. still had that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So now I think that, I mean, I, if I'm speculating and I think I'm right, like my memory is just weird these days because you, you go through stuff, your mind does compartmentalize and it starts to block stuff off. It's protection. Right? It's absolutely protection. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely, it's protection and it's survival. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, some of these people that I hear go into these deep hypno hypnotic things to like retrieve all that. No, thing. I don't want to know. There's a reason why I don't remember. <laughs> it's like, I don't need to remember that. I, you know what? I, you know, I was there the first time. Yeah. I don't need to watch that movie again. Mm -mm. Like I don't, you know what? Like, cause the way I'm doing the way I am right now, it's like, I'm not all things considered. I'm doing pretty good. I don't yeah. need to revisit that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's incredible. Yeah. So that was, so in about six months, I, I mean, I'm just guessing. So that was 2004. Well, 2005 would be more of the same, but then 2006, that was the last year before I got diagnosed. And like I said, it does spiral faster and faster. So in 2006, um, three different pneumonias put me in the hospital, um, tubes down the throat, and like all the stuff, all of it, like they were bad. Um, I mean, are you just wanting to scream uncle at this point? Like, I'm just done. Like, yes. uh, well, you see, but yeah, but I mean, yes, yes, I'll say yes. But then here's the thing. People have asked me, did you ever think about suicide? Why didn't you? It's a fair question. It's fair. Cause I did. It's obviously at this point, you know, I'm 10 years in at this point, right? Mm -hmm. 2006, it's a decade. A decade in hell does not feel like a decade in Palm Beach, man. Sure. It doesn't. It's, it's an eternity. And it's just more of the same. And well, it's not more of the same because it's worse and it's more often. And every single one is that much worse and it's that much sooner. And it's fat, it's sooner and sooner. It's just, it's hell. It's literal hell. But I didn't because that's all, all I had was life. That's all I, it sucked. But that's all I had. Yeah. And I, I guess I said that wrong. I didn't mean had, were you contemplating no. the end? I guess I meant oh, more no, no, like no. I, that was just me saying it, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I guess I just meant more like, you know, you, you've, you've, you've done your best. You've given me everything. What else could this possibly be? Like, are you just at the point where, you know, give me experimental drugs? I mean, I don't, whatever is out there, just <laughs> give it to me. I'm, I'm so tired of it. Um, I, th I honestly think at that point, and I don't think it's weakness. Like I was, I was just defeated Yeah. in that sense in terms of like hope. I hadn't hoped for a long time. My spirit was there and that I didn't give up and man, Absolutely. I can endure I, the stuff I've endured. I know I can keep going because you can't like, again, what is the choice? You can either give up or you can keep going as much as it sucks. And when you don't have a choice, you, you, you go through it. You embrace exactly. the suck. Well, you don't embrace it. I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> no, you, you try. Well, what you do is you dissociate. And that's, I spent a lot of years observing this hellish life existing and happening to somebody else. I was just in here like a little teeny dude, like a little pilot inside this watching it happen. I was completely dissociated. Wow. Um, it, again, survival, right? You I was going to say, but do you think that protected you? Was that protection? 100%. Yeah. It is it is protection. Although I'll also admit that since then, I mean that was you know, many moons ago. It also hinders me sometimes because it's pretty easy because of COVID now, and I didn't even get into that. I got a lung disease. I don't talk about that in my TED talk. I got a lung disease six months before COVID hit. Again, great story. So nowadays, six feet, everybody, get away from me because you mm. all have COVID. That's the way I got to live. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying it's going to kill me if I get it, but sure. I don't want to find out. Um, so I spend a lot of time alone and it's really easy to, cause I, you dissociate, you live kind of just in a world of daydreaming and mm -hmm. living in your brain the whole time. So it's pretty easy to fall into that, which isn't great. 
So I kind of have to jar myself out of it. Um, but again, it's, it's there for a reason. It's, it's to protect yourself, survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got through it. Um, 2006 was three of those pneumonias. And then like the last two, it got to the point where I was, in, I was living in the hospital more than I was out of the hospital. It got to that point with the last two pneumonias. Uh, 